thank you uh, for singing and for uh, we worshipped our Lord and Savior and with song. We're going to spend some time in prayer. Uh, there's a few things that we, we need to be thinking about as we pray this morning. Uh, first of all, we thank God that we're here and we, we're able to worship Him uh, together this day. I'm sure if, you, if you've been watching the news at all, you can't help but see uh, things happening around the world. Uh, we think of Afghanistan and uh, all that's going on there, uh, particularly reports of uh, uh, Christians being targeted and uh, uh, executed on the spot. Uh, we, we need to pray uh, for their protection, but also that they will stand firm uh, in Christ in those moments. We, we, don't, we haven't a clue <laughs> here in Ireland what it's like. We think we do, we, we just don't. Uh, and uh, so, so our, our thoughts are with our brothers and sisters there, but also the whole country. They need stability, they need good leadership, uh, and that is not there right now. So we pray for Afghanistan, we pray for Haiti as well, uh, another earthquake, a very poor nation. Poverty stricken, and uh, we just uh, pray for them. Uh, again, uh, leadership. We pray for safety. We pray. Uh, we pray Lord, that those who uh, are affected by uh, this, that they will be found, uh, and that they will be well. There's health concerns within our church at this moment. Time. There's a few uh, needing hospital treatment. Without going into any details right now, um, um, just to spend some time praying for them uh, this morning as well. Uh, we have a uh, school year is about upon us. We have children going back to school, uh, going up, going from primary school to secondary school. We have people uh, going to study abroad over the next year. Uh, there's, there's many uh, to be praying for the. And then, of course, uh, Sean, as he comes to speak, Nancy, she teaches the children and our, our children as they go out to activate. So, shall we pray? There's a, a, a lot of things. Uh, shall we pray? Our Lord God, that we come to you uh, this morning and uh, we do indeed just uh, praise you, Lord, for the safety, Lord, that we have in coming to worship you, Lord, that we're able to stream it uh, online, Lord, we're able to gather in person. Uh, and Lord, we, we just uh, praise you uh, for that, Lord, uh, Lord. Help us not to take the freedom, Lord, that we have for granted uh, in this world, but also to recognize that our ultimate freedom is found in you and not in the rules and regulations of this world. For that freedom is in you and you alone. Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters, particularly in Afghanistan, this at this moment in time, Lord. We can't even imagine uh, the the fear, Lord, that they, they must be feeling right now. Lord, we pray, Lord, that they will stand strong in you in these days, Lord, that their faith will not waver, but, Lord, that they will stand for the truth that you and you alone are the way to the Father. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, that if these are their last moments, Lord, that you will take them home to be with you. But, Lord, if if it is possible, Lord, we pray, Lord, that they, their lives will be spared and their testimony will be heard around the world. Lord, that they will uh, be able to tell of how they stood in the face of death. And Lord, because of you, they conquered. Lord, we pray for those in power in that country right now. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will turn their hearts to you. And all that they will lead with your strength and your wisdom and not their own. Not Satan's, but yours. Lord, we pray for the safety of each and every person in that country right now. We pray for the, the foreign uh, diplomats who are there who are trying to get out. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they will uh, be strong. Lord, that they will be able to help as much as possible Lord, those, the natives of Afghanistan. Lord, we also pray for Haiti right now. We pray for uh, those caught up in the earthquake. Lord, we pray for safety uh, for those who are trapped. Lord, we pray, Lord, that they will be able to be found in time. We pray for strength for the workers trying to rescue. 
Lord, we pray for, uh, again, we pray for the government, we pray for provisions, and Lord, we pray for that, uh, Lord, that, that country will be able to work itself out of poverty. Lord, we good leadership. Lord, we pray for our own church here in Bad Wigan right now. Lord, you know, Lord, the, uh, the health concerns within the church. Lord, you know, Lord, to are needing to see hospital uh, treatment just now. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will encourage them in these moments so that they will uh, know your peace and your love and your care right now as well. Lord, we pray for the doctors and nurses and the surgeons, Lord, that are going to be treating them. Lord, we pray, Lord, that they will do their work to the best of their ability and that they will be successful. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as a church, that Lord, we will be able to support them in whatever way, Lord, that we can, in whatever way they need right now. Lord, we pray for our students in the church, uh, many going back to school in the next week or two. Lord, uh, new classes, new teachers. Lord, we, we think of them. Lord, whether they're changing school, some are changing school, going up to secondary school, but it's a big time for them. Lord, we pray for them on the other as they get to know uh, their new school surroundings, as they get to know uh, the new way of doing things. Those who are going to study abroad, going off to university this year. Lord, we can just pray for them as well. Lord, we ask Lord, that uh, even in foreign lands, Lord, that they will know how close you are to them. And Lord, that they will uh, be able to gain all that they need to by studying and working abroad. Lord, and the experiences Lord, that that will bring them. Lord, we pray Lord, that they will be able to be used as a Sure, it's a full battle in the days and weeks and years ahead. Lord, we pray for Sean as he comes and speaks to us. Lord, we thank you for him. Thank you for the way he diligently prepares and, and studies your word uh, to, to bring it to us. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, you will use that study, Lord, you will use that preparation, Lord, that he has put in. And Lord, that you will use it to speak to us, to teach us, to guide us in your words in these days. Pray for Nancy as well and the preparation of what she's put in as she teaches the children. Lord, may you speak through them this day. Pray for the children as they go out and us as we stay in and listen uh, to show them. The children as they go out and uh, talk through Nancy. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, we will hear you today. Lord, we just pray all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. to invite Sean to come up just now and the children to head. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to be opening in Galatians chapter 1, please. In my opening prayer, I was going to mention Afghanistan as, as, as well. Uh, James, James and Kate. Our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, and uh, I was listening to somebody talk about Afghanistan during the week from a church perspective and apparently it is the second fastest growing church in the world uh, and the fastest growing is Iran which surprised me and uh, so I've got that whole region that under terrible persecution and we do have an expert in the church here on church persecution and that's that Stuart. So if anybody has questions about people around the world who are suffering in different countries, um, Stuart would be the person to talk to. But again, we just think of we land to James and Claire as we open up this morning. Father, we, we, we thank you for we thank you for what we have here. We thank you for 
peace. We thank you for the ability that we have at this point in time, and at this juncture in August, that we can meet and, and, and talk with each other, and that we can praise you and communion with each other. And Lord, we just again just bring those suffering, not only in Afghanistan, not only in Iran, not only in Haiti, but your children around the world, Lord, and those who are calling. As one person said during the week in one of the one of the villages, the elders started doing a Bible study when the Taliban were coming. And some of the Taliban got saved. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I, I pray that it is. But it came through one of the Christian ministries. Um, so Lord, it, it seems in persecution that you're working. And we just we just add our voices to the voices of so many people around the world. And we ask this. In your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The theme for this morning from Galatians is a it's a it's a it's a pleading with you that as we approach difficult times, um, that each of us will be found faithful. And it's a pleading with us that we wouldn't turn away, yeah? To not to turn away from the truth. And I'm going to start this morning with a question. And I'm going to ask for your input. So don't be shy. And you're not allowed to answer, James. <laughs> and no, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> what is the gospel? In its, in, in its pure, simplest form, what's the gospel? Good news. Good news, okay. And what's the good news? Okay, the word of God, Jesus. And <coughs> what else? If somebody was to come from a different island today now, if somebody, let's say they discovered an island in the middle of the Atlantic and it was going to be swept over by a big wave, and the Irish government was the closest with a ship and they got the ten citizens out of them, they brought them to that ready this morning, and we were to tell them what the gospel was in a couple of seconds. What would you tell them? Good news of salvation, which Jesus Christ can receive. Okay. And give us hope. Yeah. That there is eternal life and that we can be in relationship with God through the Son Jesus Christ. Excellent. Yeah. Great. So it's all centered on the work of Jesus Christ, yeah? And everything that He's done for us as, as sinners. Yeah. So there's a purity, there's a goodness to the gospel message. And that purity stands in stark contrast to what is a fallen world, yeah? And a sinful world. This world is, is removed from God, a holy God, but yet he gives us access through Jesus Christ. Yeah, is that fair? Yeah? And it's a message, as you said, it's a message of hope. It's a message of eternal life. And it's a message that was, that cost God his very own son, who came to live amongst us. And he had this cruel death on a cross, and he shed his blood so that we could be washed. And we were chatting about that this morning, Caroline, that he washed in his blood, yeah? And on the third day, Jesus Christ rose again and allowed us the access to our Heavenly Father. There's a war against our souls. We have an enemy in this world. We have a number of enemies. The outworking of the enemy in our own lives is sin. And each of us, while we are saved, that sinful nature kind of snaps at our heels, yeah? And we fall to the flesh and we fall to the works of this world and we're drawn back to this world. And of course, there's an old enemy. Who would you tell those island citizens about? Who's the enemy? The devil, yeah, yeah. And in the midst of this life and, and everything that goes on and 
that tension between the hope that we have in Christ and the wrestle that we have as, as an old preacher in the north called it it's kind of an internal civil war yeah where there's this tension between the holiness of God that we know we need to be aspiring to and our ineptitude when it comes to trying to live a spotless life because we, we just we, we can't and in the mix of that tension some people turn back some people fall away and then others commit themselves more and more and more to following their saviour and it's the same in the church setting and what we're told in this particular book that some venture into the church setting to rob to rob our hope yeah like like weeds growing amidst the the fields that are ready for harvest if you're driving down the roads here over towards the Nall or back in towards Dublin or up towards Dublin, you'll see that the harvesters are out and they're harvesting. But there's a fair share of weeds in those harvests. So there's wolves amidst the sheep. And part of the role that we play in the church, each one of us, is that we, we watch and we're, we're careful and we, we test and anything we hear from myself or James or Noel or whoever's up here, Stuart has started to talk that we're able to test like the variants that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, yeah? This issue of wolves amongst the sheep is not a new issue because Paul writes about it in the book of Galatians and we're going to read across Galatians today. We're starting chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 1 to 10. So Paul, verse 1, an apostle, not from men, not through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Peace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So we're going to focus our talks in and around verses 8 or 9 today. Verse 8 again. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, and what we have preached to you, let it be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And I'm going to put this down here for my time so that I can check it to make sure that I'm not going over. So, any change to what James or Noel or I or Stuart or anybody who talks up here teaches you. It's a false gospel. Any change, yeah? And that's one of the things, if I can use the word pride in, 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 in a church setting, it's one of the things that this church would pride itself is that we are faithful to preaching the gospel of Christ with no additions. Full stop. God's word. Um, and from what I see and from what I read and from what I hear those churches seem to be falling by the wayside there seems to be a lot of wolves in the church so the call is for us to watch for deception now how does this happen? well let's look at Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and this is Paul at the start speaking about 
what he did at the outset of his ministry. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach amongst the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay? So we see that we see these brave men in the church in Jerusalem, and we see Paul joining them. Um, some of the names you read in the Old Testament are Peter, Paul, John, James. Yeah, you're familiar with those names. And these were brave men, and that they stood in the midst of the people at that time to bring them the gospel message, which is the message of Jesus, your salvation in Jesus, the hope in Jesus through his death, his burial, and as James said earlier, his resurrection, through the shedding of his blood. That's the message. And right throughout the New Testament, and to this day, 2,000 years later, many people, like Paul, who we read about, suffered persecution. They worked in the midst of what was an empire at the time, and countries were subjugated to that empire. And many believers at that time paid with their lives the same way that so many poor unfortunates this week were murdered for the name of Christ. The good news is that they went straight to be with the Lord, but it cost them their lives here. Paul was in a similar place, Peter was in a similar place, John was in prison later in Patmos where he wrote Revelation so many years later. So many people died and that there was a constant threat of violence, yeah? And that constituted the time frame that they were living in. But within that mix, the church was put into a situation where people came in to distort that purity, that message of hope, that message of eternal life in Christ. It came in by God's brethren, people to pretending to be Christians, people pretending to be believers. It came in by stealth. Now when I think of stealth, I think of the stealth bomber that the Americans have. Nobody can see it or hear it, and it travels at such a, an incredible speed that it done its business before it's even registered that it's there, yeah? Secret, in by secret, yeah? Later on, Paul talks about seductive flattery in words, yeah? People coming in with, with that intention of breaking up the church. Either to break up the church in front of everybody or to secure for themselves a position of power, yeah? That they can become the, the person making all decisions, yeah? But the encouraging word that Paul mentions here in verse 5 is we didn't yield to submission. That despite these people coming in, and this teaching we'll see from Paul right across these epistles, there was no submission to it. Yeah? From the perspective of Paul and Peter, there would have been at the time Jews coming in to the church to try to get people into bondage under Jewish law again. Yeah? That yes, you can have Jesus. But you have to satisfy the law 100%. And as James writes in his gospel, sorry, in his epistle, the epistle of James, if you break one of the laws, you're guilty of all. Yeah? So these people coming in, nipping at the heels, trying to take the liberty that is in Christ. So brought in by stealth to spy out and take liberty. Now, who do we have our liberty in? Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ, and in Him alone. 
So again, as you read through the New Testament in your own time, be aware that the as teaching in many of the epistles is people coming in to try and add to the simplicity of the gospel of grace to get people under the yoke of bondage again for the law yeah it's great to have jesus but you have to do something else as well that's what they would say and here we see that people were coming in to the churches trying to get the gentile believers to be circumcised like the jews so people love to add something to salvation. It's Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus the love, Jesus plus your good works, Jesus plus your own righteousness, Jesus plus your money. Yeah? It's never just Jesus and what he did. Yeah? It's almost as if Jesus is not enough. And the truth is, and it came from you this morning, that Jesus alone, he and nobody else, is what the gospel is. Jesus is enough. Now look out at verse 16 in chapter 2. Again, Paul follows the same argument down through chapter 2, but he does say this in verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You're justified by Christ. You're justified by his work on Calvary's cross and his resurrection three days later and your faith in that alone. His righteousness being given to you as a gift. Now, the problem that they had in the church in Galatia with these people coming in 2,000 years ago can become our problem very easily today in 2021. Time does not eradicate, nor does it diminish the threat. Indeed, I'd argue that the threat will increase the nearer we get to the end of times. And we look at that later. But surely we'd say that couldn't happen here. We wouldn't be the first church to say that, and we wouldn't be the first church to fall. We recognise that we've spent the best part of 18 months in lockdown, where we've had no fellowship, or no mixing in an environment with, with, with born-again Christian believers, most of us staying at home to look at different talks and sermons on, on the internet. Um, there's been very little talking, there's been very little sharing, there's been very little community, and most of our time, if, if I can only look at my, my own life over the last 18 months, most people I've met have been unbelievers. So, stealth is subtle. No, you talked many years ago about, is it Pat or Rob of Dublin talking about, about being in a boat and you're close to the shore and you take your eye off what you're doing in the boat, maybe to have a sandwich or have a chat with somebody, and the next thing you've drifted out into the sea, yeah? Because you haven't been watching. And that's one of the one of the things that has happened over the last 18 months for so many people that we've kind of been adrift by ourselves in the boat. We've been reliant on other things and we've slowly drifted. We might see it on a day-to-day -day basis, but maybe six months in we see that we've moved away in another six months, we've moved a little bit further, yeah? And that's what happens. Stealth is very, very subtle, and we don't notice it apparently. The other point I'd like to make is that no matter where we're born in the world, and there's people from all around the world here this morning, we're born into what is a prevailing tradition, yeah? 
So if you're born in India, for example, chances are you're Hindu. Yeah? If you're born into Brazil, chances are you're Catholic. If you're born into the Philippines, chances are you can baptize as a child and say Roman Catholicism. If you're born like James in that great city called Paul, chances are yeah? <laughs> chances are you were brought up in the Church of England. Yeah? If you're born in certain parts of Germany and Scandinavia, chances are you were brought up in a Lutheran tradition. Yeah? If you're born in Saudi Arabia, chances are you're brought up as a Muslim. It's just the way the world is. There's prevailing traditions all around the world. Now some of these traditions claim to be Christian, and many are, and many aren't. Many have shades of the truth, many have untruths within it, yeah? And in fact, you could argue that established churches and traditions can oftentimes be the enemy of real salvation and real truth because they've built up over the years into something that morphed from what was an original truth. So let's look at our own experience here in Ireland. As an example, Ireland would be seen as a stronghold of the Vatican, very strong Roman Catholic background. Most of us in this country, 95% of us, are born into that tradition. In the UK, most people would be born into the Church of England. Yeah? The majority of people in this country have abandoned that tradition, equating that tradition or thinking that that tradition is pure Christianity. Yeah? That's what happens. When you get tired of the tradition, you equate it sometimes in your mind with what is the truth. But Christianity can't be right because what I grew up in was wrong. Yeah? It's like a mathematical equation. They have to be the same. But they're not. Right? So, for example, certainly what I was brought up in in this country, and I know no one might have chatted about this many times because he was brought up in the same tradition. And what we were brought up in in our tradition, which we thought was Christian, we were told that salvation was by the Church of Rome only and our adherence to Catholic dogma. We're told that Jesus is not the only way. We're told that grace is delivered by participation in the sacraments which were made up and not found in the New Testament. We're told that when we die we go to a place called purgatory. We don't go to heaven, we don't go to hell, we go to a middle place. And our family pay money to get us out of there. Right? We're not told that the Mass is a re-sacrifice of Jesus again and again and again. So every time there's a mass anywhere in the world, it's the re-sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. So it's been Calvary in their mind that has happened trillions of times since the inception of it. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, tells us that Christ died once for our sins. We're told, and we were taught, that private Bible reading, it's not prohibited. But it's not really encouraged because only a priest can interpret God's word. The call in England 700 years ago was that the Bible, God's word, would be put into the hands of the plowman. Yeah? The farmers said that they wanted the plowman, the simple country farmer lad, to be able to understand the scriptures in their own language. Yeah? So, what am I saying? I'm saying that from an outside perspective, it looks so seductive. If I'm the outsider coming from the island, oh, that must be right. They've got all these wonderful clothes and they've got all the pomp and they've got these wonderful churches and they seem to be telling the truth. It must be right. But when you dig into the prevailing tradition, the cracks start to appear. Yeah? When you're raised into something as a child and you're educated in that way, 
no differently to anybody else in their environment. Over time, it's difficult to think that something else might be true and that what you've been brought up in is not. That's the way seduction works. And that's why I wanted to parallel that with what we read about Galatians. Now, what does God's word tell us in relation to that tradition? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're told, For I deliver to you, again this is Paul writing, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Nothing else. It's not Jesus plus this, that, or the other. It's not Jesus plus your works or your money. In Ephesians 2, we read, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's Jesus, and it's Jesus alone with nothing added, no room for submission, no room for others coming in trying to say, well, you need to do the sacraments. Well, you're, yeah, you're going to heaven, but really, first you're going to purgatory. I mean, how do I get out of there? Well, your family will pay for the masses. See how it works? It's very seductive. Grace is free. Salvation, your salvation, my salvation, James' salvation, Noel's salvation, Stuart's salvation, Caroline's salvation, anybody who stands up here, their salvation is a free gift of God. Full stop. <coughs> Nothing else happens. So, what's my point? The outside does not always reveal the inside. The outside does not always reveal what the truth is. Deception is seductive. And sometimes you'll see that the majority follow blindly what they're told without thinking or without reading without asking God. What tradition and what teachings were you brought up in, in your particular countries? And as a Christian, have you looked at what you were brought up with versus what you read in God's Word? I think it's an important exercise for everybody to do because it it commits us to Christ and to the faith that he gives us when we realise that some of the things we were brought up with were completely wrong. I can only speak for myself. So, discern, it's a very important word, I'm going to check the time. Discern, arm yourself with the truth. Be careful of some of the door knockers that are walking around. Some of them are snake oil salesmen, right? So for example, we get Jehovah's Witnesses calling at the door in Ireland. They teach that Jesus is not God, that he is a God. They contravene scripture. They contravene the teaching in Romans, John chapter 1, Matthew 12, John 8. Um, the Psalm, Psalms 95, Psalm 100, the book of Revelation, yeah, I can go on and on. The Mormons teach that Jesus' brother is Satan. If that was true, it would mean that Jesus isn't the only begotten Son of God. Yeah, see how subtle it is. In Matthew 24, Jesus was asked about the end of the age. And he mentioned things like earthquakes, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be rumours of wars, etc. But a number of times, I've counted three, 
He said to people, don't be deceived. Many will come in my name. But time and time again, he said, deception, deception, deception. And he's speaking that in the age that he was asked about, the end of times. Yeah? So, are we like those? Are we like those in Galatia? Yes, we are. Because we're human. We have our failings. And we can be deceived. We have to be careful. Okay? Our liberty, as we've said, was purchased by Christ. He shed his blood. God Almighty came to earth, shed his blood on a Roman cross. He died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. On believing that and confessing that with your mouth, having repented of your sins, the word of God in Ephesians says that God seals you with his Holy Spirit freely for the day of your redemption. Let's look at that last verse we read again, Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's by Jesus alone. Now, I'm going to leave you with, with, with something that's been niggling at me for, for the last while. And it started to happen in a couple of countries already. And it may happen here, and it may not happen again. We might go into lockdown again in autumn and winter. It's happened in a couple of countries. New Zealand this week, Australia this week, Israel again. Don't be surprised, but let's be prepared. During the previous lockdown, we couldn't meet the fellowship, and many of us looped into the internet to download the sermons and to listen to stuff. And we've listened to many sermons from many people around the world. Be careful and discern who you're listening to. So, for example, if you listen to something from America, the prosperity gospel is huge in America. And I would say that the majority of sermons on the internet in America are people saying, God's going to save you, and you're a king's child, and you're going to be rich, and you're asking for a Mercedes, and you send me $20, and he'll give you the Mercedes. Yeah, it's called the prosperity gospel. Be careful. There's very little discernment when it comes to the internet, because mostly we're sitting by ourselves. And we can't ask people questions. And we can't turn to somebody afterwards and say, was well, he the same right? We, we just, we take it in and we, we, we take it as fact, you know? So question what you're listening to. Be careful who you listen to. If you have questions, even when you're sitting at home listening to the sermon, if you have questions, pick up the phone. Ring James, ring Noel, ring me. Ask George. You're about many monsters. Can I come up for a copy? Can we meet for a copy? You know, just just ask. Talk to one another and engage. Build your friendships. Continue to do that. <coughs> While it's very important to ask how people are, particularly if we're locked down and we're isolated, that's the most important question. How are you doing? Are you okay? <coughs> when we're meeting as a church and we find out that we are okay. Let's go a little bit deeper in our conversations. Let's ask each other, what are you reading about? What, what, what are you reading? What book are you reading at the minute? What's God telling you? Yeah? The chief snake oil salesman, the devil, is on a rampage. And he hates you. He hates you because he hates Jesus. He detests you. He deplores you. And more so because you're a Christian and you're a believer. And there's no end to what he'd like to perpetrate upon you. So pray. Be careful what you listen to. 
ask questions, discern, understand, make contact with each other, and pray. Be careful of deception and mind each other. Yeah? For parents, I was thinking this during the week, lift your children up to the Lord for his protection. Because nobody outside of your family, bar the old prayer meeting that we had, nobody else is going to do it for you. Yeah? Lift your children up to God for his care, for his love, for his direction, for his salvation, for that wonderful free gift that we've been blessed with. It's the chiefest of our responsibilities for those of us who are children. Nobody else will do it. So with that, let's bow our heads. Father, I do lift our children up to you. We are your children, even sitting in this room, as what we perceive to be adults by the world, where we're your children. And we lift ourselves up to you, Lord, humbly, repenting of our sins, seeking your forgiveness, looking to be washed by your blood, to be cleansed from our, our thoughts and our sins, the sins that everybody else can see and for the secret sins. Lord, we, we can't, as James said about those poor people in Afghanistan, we can't imagine what they've been through. Lord, we can't imagine what you went through for each one of us. So we can only come humbly, Lord, and we, we come to praise you, we come to worship you, we come to ask your help. We come to ask you for our children, for, for their lives, Lord, and for their salvation. And as we set them off to school or their jobs or abroad in the next week or two to study, we commit them to you, Lord. We commit them to your love, we commit them to your grace, and we commit their eternal security, Lord, to you, and we ask that you would draw each and every one of them onto you in a way that they know it's you, Lord. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Lord Jesus. And we ask for your blessing across the coming week. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sean, uh, for that. Um, just, um, we're going to sing together uh, another song, and as we do, we're going to uh, take up uh, the offering. We're going to sing, Thank You for the Lord's Song.
raise our offering of our monetary gifts just now. Lord, will be used by you for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Uh, a couple of announcements uh, this morning. The first is that uh, we will meet again on Sunday, uh, the 29th at 10.30 here at St. George's uh, National School. We, uh, earlier in our prayer time, we mentioned there's a few people who are uh, needing um, hospital treatment and, and things like that uh, over this next little while. Uh, one of them is, is asking if uh, someone could take her to the hospital on Wednesday morning. Uh, she needs to be there about 7 o'clock in the morning, so if there's somebody available who's able to take her to uh, uh, Beaumont Hospital, this week, that would be helpful. Uh, come and see me, and then I will uh, I'll connect you up uh, on that. Also, on Tuesday night, uh, someone would like uh, to visit at six o'clock to help with uh, some medical uh, supplies. Uh, so, so um, again, uh, particularly if you're if you're a medical person, you have some idea of that, and you're available at six o'clock. Again, see me, and I will uh, will uh, put you in touch. Obviously, we don't want to uh, be announcing everything from the front. Uh, and so that's why we uh, uh, announce it like this, rather than uh, uh, um, uh, uh, betray confidences and, and things like that as well. So uh, we, we, we do want to uh, be sensitive to these things. So just to let you know, that's, that's some of the needs that we, in the church, at the moment, it's one of the ways in which we can be the church that support each other and care for each other. word of benediction uh, for us uh, just now. And uh, we close our uh, corporate time together. So from 2 Peter chapter 3, and 14 and 18. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. And we come in the church.